Live. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? It is Monday, December 27th, 2021. I can't believe there's more of this year left. I couldn't believe there was more of last year left. About this time, last year, as a matter of fact. So, you know, I surprise myself with this constantly. And, uh, well, a lot of things I surprise myself with constantly. Like, there's a show, and it's coming up, and you got to get ready. You want to eat breakfast beforehand, or prepare in some method, you know. So, anyway. Your usual uh, Monday morning story. So, trying to catch up with everything. Uh, production crew not yet uh, in studio. Uh, by the way, some of the other production crew uh, who actually never produce much and are usually asleep all this time are found uh, asleep on the basement couch <laughs> this morning, never having even ascended the stairs to their room. So, that's about how we're doing during the school break in the uh, KITM World Headquarters anyway. So, okay, let's see. We got to get the... Let's find a time to grab some water, finish up the tea. You know, we'll have Greg Dworkin in. He'll tell you what's in the news while I do all of that. Uh, Not a... uh, uh, We had a nice, quiet weekend, as you should, right? I mean, one of them was a silent night, so you know it was going to be pretty quiet anyway. And uh, it was great to not have a president who was tweeting that people ought to drop dead or anything like that during Christmas. Though we had the residual effects of having such a president, of course, as I learned over the weekend, as President Biden and his uh, wife, First Lady Jill Biden, sat to take the calls of kids who were calling the NORAD Santa tracking line, as the presidents do each year. Uh, you will recall, of course, that Donald Trump sat and uh, said, hey, isn't it weird that you still believe in Santa at like seven or eight years old or something like that? Eh, okay, you know, not the worst thing in the world, but certainly not the worst thing he said and certainly not the worst things he said to kids at some point, maybe even his own. But at any rate, Biden sitting and doing the normal thing and wishing kids a Merry Christmas, etc. Also had his phone call, uh, I don't know, interjected upon by dad who was on the line who said, OK, Merry Christmas and did the let's go Brandon thing to him. And, uh, you know, that was a nice thing to do during Christmas. Of course, the, the dad knew what he was doing. And apparently uh, either Joe Biden didn't know or didn't care what he was doing and that became as much an issue for the right as anything. I guess uh, Stephen Miller was on TV for whatever reason. No one really knows why. And he was saying, oh, that just goes to show you that uh, Joe Biden doesn't know what's going on out there. He's out of touch with reality. He doesn't know the right wing's favorite code words for saying something nasty and dirty to Joe Biden, which I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't keep up on. But I wouldn't also not be surprised if he was just like, yeah, you know, you're going to face this every once in a while. And we'll just pretend that we don't know what it means, and that'll leave them exasperated. And so it has. So it's triggered the right, I guess. They're all angry that Joe Biden isn't keeping up with the latest stupid code words for F. Joe Biden. I really don't know exactly what they thought Joe Biden was going to say to that. I challenge the guy to a duel, tell the kid he should drop dead. I don't know. Anyway, so he didn't do either of those things, which is great because he's a mature person and president of the United States. And uh, we move on. Okay, let's see. Um, All right. Well, let me uh, pick up on what we have laid aside. Oh, you know what we have in the morning? We always have morning tweet from Bill. The K-Girl in the Morning radio show is live now. I thought I would tell you that before we got too far into things. K-Girl X, that's me, the actual host of K-Girl in the Morning says there's even more 2021 ahead of us. This is true. I I really thought we were just kind of done with this. I feel like I didn't have enough time off this time around. I told you I was feeling ripped off by the weekend uh, Christmas, but not not that I expected anything weird to happen. Just everybody just go take time off. Or I expected cold weather. I didn't get that either. Anyway, uh, there's more 2021 ahead of us. uh, But how much more of this can we take? Mr. Spock, just how much more can we take? So, 
Yeah, a little Star Trek, uh, always a good idea in the morning. This, uh, I guess we're down to the last couple of days here. It just really does feel kind of odd. I feel like, uh, I don't know, like uh, I should have been spending more time uh, in the house, uh, 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 Again, you know, buffeting against the breezes outside. It was cold. It was about 70 degrees over the weekend here. We had a nice balmy time. I understand Greg had some snowfall. I think I saw some tweeted pictures of a light dusting of snow. There was, I must have been some kind of weird weather front because down here, you're not that far south. And, uh, you know, like I said, 70 degrees and just a couple hours to the north, a couple hours drive to north, there were getting dusting of snow. And, uh, eh, you know, it's to be expected there will be some difference. But I just thought, you know, usually the East Coast moves as one in these things. Not this time. Ah, anyway, I was thankful for it. It was very nice. We got out, got a little walk in, you know, so pleasant, whatever. If you were delivering presents, jumping down chimneys, you would be pleased to find that the chimneys had not been lit recently because of the warm weather, that sort of thing. Everyone could find something to be glad about during the holiday weekend. And we have another holiday weekend coming up. Um, I guess the biggest impact for me so far, besides feeling like I'm not getting big midweek breaks like we usually get, uh, I'm finding that uh, everybody is out of their offices. Nobody's doing anything and you can't get anything done in the last two weeks, which will give you a pretty good preview of where we'll be when everybody gets Omicron and stops going to work as well. Greg Dworkin is here. I thought we might make that transition to the big pandemic and the big pandemic weekend, uh, during which I did not catch it successfully again. That's good news. Hope the same was uh, true for you. Good morning, Greg. Uh, Good morning, whoever you are. A a really interesting little uh, helpful message just popped up on my Skype call. I use Skype to call into the show to talk to David. You got a helpful but, message. But this morning, uh, it said, David Waldman is unavailable. Oh, so, well, like, who are you? Uh, yes, it's emotionally unavailable, Greg. That's Oh, okay. Well, that that explains it. So you're on your own. Uh, what do I care? So the uh, theme oh, okay. that I had for the uh, pundit roundup that I put up this morning for yes. Daily Coast uh, is that this is the calm before the Omicron storm. Oh, no wonder it was so calm. Because uh, counting pauses for the holidays. Oh, yes, right. Oh, for the the storm of numbers. Yeah, you can't know how many cases and what's going on if, like, nobody tells you. That's true. You can go on Twitter and see how many people say they have it. You can, and there's a lot. Yeah. And there's some other uh, indications we have about what's going on here. Uh, One, for example, this is where inference comes in and indirect reasoning. Hmm. You don't know, I don't know how many uh, people in the airline industry currently have COVID and of them, how many have Omicron. Hmm. But you do know that there's a lot of flights that have been canceled because they can't put a crew together. Oh, yes. Uh, also, the CEOs are sick, as it turns out. Yeah. Well, uh, part of the thing there, though, is that you have to remember that it sort of doesn't matter what Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis, or for that matter, what Ned Lamont and uh, Kathy Hochul and and, uh, Gavin Newsom do. It's what the people in their states do and what happens to them. And they can say, well, here's what I think you should do. Here's what I think your body should do when confronted with Omicron. But, you know, if you get it, you get it. And so if you're sick and you call in sick, that's a problem. I mean, that's been a problem. And, of course, the biggest problem has been for the healthcare system, and that still goes on. So some stuff on that. Here's the New York Times, another Christmas of death and distress in America's ICUs. <laughs> All right. The, the toll on healthcare workers, many of whom are giving up their holiday to treat dangerously ill COVID patients, right. is severe. Good point. So that still goes on. All right. And, uh, of course, uh, I had to include this Mike Corey tweet. Good morning to everybody working in our hospitals. I don't know how you're holding up, but bless you. I'm sorry we're putting you through this. Yeah. Uh, Howard Foreman, who is a uh, healthcare uh, wonk and radiologist from Yale, and a foreman, uh, says uh, Omicron is dominant in Connecticut now. Oh, what we're seeing in hospitalized patients is probably still Delta because they've been here for a while. But for four days in a row, Yale is reporting uh, oh. seventy-five to eighty percent of the cases are Omicron. Okay, so clearly it's in Connecticut. We know it's in New York. 
And uh, what happens here is that, uh, yes, we have a, a difference between what's going on with the case reporting, which is different than what's going on with the cases, far greater than what the cases are reporting. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is different than who winds up in the hospital, which is different than who winds up dying. And yes, we know that there's a lag of three to four weeks in between the cases and the hospitals and the dying part. But nonetheless, uh, you know, some things are being exposed right now. And one of the things that's being exposed, as Peter Hotes puts it, exactly. our U.S. health system is so feeble, there's no COVID reporting this weekend. Sometime mm, around yeah. Tuesday morning, they'll turn the machines back on and look at the numbers. <laughs> turn those machines back on. Exactly. Right. I predict further increases in hospitalization and healthcare worker depletion. Hope the system doesn't collapse. Hey, and too. Eric Topol, another expert, says our COVID data tracking is shameful and has been from day one. When COVID-19 tracking stopped, remember those journalists who put together that great site? And then back in March, they said, well, we're going to stop because uh, CDC is <laughs> going to take over and they'll do it. Oh, and CDC over. didn't step up, and it completely fell apart, uh, and uh, that's a problem. Now, uh, again, I have to remind our listeners that CDC and HHS are separate entities. CDC works for HHS, and CDC is a clearinghouse rather than an ongoing behemoth entity of its own. That is to say, CDC doesn't collect anything. Oh. The states collect, oh, give doing? it to CDC, CDC reports, CDC coordinates the states, the states do the work. So if the red states say we're not doing this, yeah. then right. CDC doesn't have any we're information. Well, no wonder. Right. Yeah. So CDC can't that. be a situation to tell us exactly what's going on. They don't know. They'd like to know, but they don't know. HHS, which is much bigger, way bigger, has a different system. HHS has hospitals reporting directly to HHS what's going on. So HHS has a better idea of what's going on in the hospitals, and they're the ones that report hospitalizations. But sometimes their uh, dashboard in holidays doesn't get updated because, like, it's the holiday. Yeah, a guy doesn't come in and type in the numbers. Yeah, exactly. Not so that's going to be a little slow as well. It's public information. You can get it. But it's hard to get updated information when you're in the middle of the holiday slowdown. And that holiday slowdown goes from between December 24th and January 2nd, you know, yeah. the whole week. Maybe a little Thanksgiving slow. even in there. You're low staff. And, of course, if they get COVID, they'll be even lower staff. Right. So all Very of that stuff Yeah, and, and it makes it difficult to know. So, uh, you know, part of the problem is that we're terrible at reporting. And part of the problem is that uh, even when we're good at reporting, this is the week <laughs> that we're terrible at reporting. So that's part of the reason why we have this uh, little lacuna in well, terms of what's going on. But uh, Ashish Jha points out that there are people in the trenches who can talk directly to us through Twitter and other means. So this is from Craig Spencer. You all remember Craig Spencer, the Ebola doctor who took the L train to Brooklyn and then found out the next day he got sick. <laughs> yes, you do uh, remember that. He's really into public <laughs> health. He goes out overseas to help to, you know, keep people from dying, and that's how he got a bowl in the first place. He did fine after that. He still works in the emergency room in New York, and he okay. says, this is from Craig Spencer, how Omicron is affecting folks coming to his emergency room. If you're boosted, yeah, it's a bad cold. All right. If you're vaxxed and unboosted, it's a really, really bad cold. Hmm. One dose J&J, &J, but no booster. Miserable, but not life-threatening. All right. Who gets hospitalized for low oxygen, serious illness, unvaccinated folks. What? So there's a real clear difference. Outrageous. We, you know, we, we've uh, intimated that. We've talked about that. We've seen it. But, but that's what they're actually seeing in the emergency room these days in New York, where there's a ton of Omicron. All right. So Matches that's a helpful report. Fair enough. I mean, you know, it was it was pretty clear from the beginning that that would likely be the case. Now it says uh, observation matches the scientific prediction. Which is always useful. Yeah, it's good to know if you were barking up the wrong tree. But it's also nice to find out if that was the right tree. Which well, you know, the tree grows in Brooklyn and you get there by the L train. The so, is in this tree. Uh, Andy Slavitt right uh, writes, uh, COVID update. I've interviewed well over 100 experts now. With Omicron, Sorry. the graphs and opinions are many. But the truths are muddled. All right. And there's plenty of contradictions, including eight important ones. In that muddy world, 
2022 will be shaped by differing circumstances and three attitudes. Hmm. Also, four flavors, uh, five <laughs> colors, and uh, earth, wind, uh, water. Yeah, right. You know, fire. Falling birds, French hands. Ice and uh, dark and light, you know, the, the classic weapons for uh, uh, magic knights. Oh, so yeah, some of the scientists I respect yes. the most, like Tom Frieden and uh, Farzad, are expressing doubts that with Omicron, efforts to prevent contagion are realistic. I doubt Yet, it. there are many of us who have worked hard to avoid COVID and don't want to stop now. Yeah. So that's true. Omicron, either because of our T-cell response, vaccination rates, inherent challenges in spreading to the lungs, that is to say it uh, preferentially settles in the bronchi and gives you a cough, but doesn't go through the lungs to give you pneumonia, or some combination is less likely to put any of us in the hospital, any one of us anyway. All right. right. So people will wind up in the hospital because of the overwhelming numbers. But you in particular, if you're boosted, unlikely that that's where you're going to wind up being, which is what Craig Spencer's seeing. But right. hospitals will be swamped because enough people will still get sick. In fact, hospitals get swamped this time of year anyway. People get the flu. And you know what else happens? And this is like really weird. Mm -hmm. But you got to figure this is like psychology. And this is where not having enough testing by the Biden administration is a legitimate complaint fault. Uh, you didn't do this right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Everybody says, oh, my God, the oh, my God variant is here. Omicron is here. And really, if you're really smart, here's what you should do. Don't get together for the holidays if you have it because you will spread it. Therefore, if you still feel like you have to get together because if we tell you not to, you're going to ignore us. You haven't seen each other in two years. What you should do is get tested, and if you're negative, then you should go and get together in small gatherings where you don't even have to wear a mask because you know you're all negative. All right. So then you go to the store, and you try to get your home huh. testing kit that you didn't prepare for three months ago, mm. and you find out they're all sold out. Yes. So now you want to get tested so you can go see Grandma. Right. Who's we you know that. on oxygen and and smokes and you, you really think she's a little fragile and, and you know you you want to get your test before you go because you want to be a good doobie, right? So you go to the hospital because they have testing. Oh. So you sit in the ER <laughs> for three hours, clogging the emergency room mm. and getting COVID, probably. and getting COVID, sitting there with people who already have it, and then you finally get your negative test and say, okay, great, it was a three hour wait, <laughs> but it was worth it for Grandma. And then you go to see grandma, and of course you got COVID while you were in the emergency room, right. and you give it three to grandma. Hour, three hour tour. And that, in Island. fact, is happening. Awesome. What a good story. <laughs> this so is the ER probably. people are tearing their hair out. What are you okay. doing here? Don't come here for your test. Go away. Yes, but they told us on TV to come and get testing, and you guys are the only people who have it, so of course we're going to come here. Which yeah. it, it makes well, perfect sense. Even... Yeah, you may recall, uh, uh, since we've been on, I've been on the show for like what uh, thirty-five years or something. Right. We talked Just about today. how in flu pandemics, if you have anti-flu medicine that's really important to use, and it's a pandemic, uh, the CDC and your local health department often doesn't have the ability to give out medications en masse. Mm. They're not set up for that. So uh, what they did back in the day is said, OK, why don't we give all the anti flu medicine to the hospitals? Oh, yes. Right. Okay. And the hospital said, don't do that. We don't want healthy people here coming for this medicine. We don't want mildly sick people coming for this medicine. We don't want anybody coming to the hospital if you don't have to be here. You'll not only catch it, but we don't have the staff to handle all this stuff. So mm. it was a big problem. That was the Tamiflu story. Yes. And so they, they learn from that, and that's why, among other reasons, your CVS can give vaccines. Ah. Back in the Tamiflu day, your CVS couldn't give vaccines. They weren't doing that it on, you know, in a large thing, scale the way they're doing it now. Okay. So that's you know part of what comes from you know learning lessons and trying to fix things that were broken. All right. So now uh, you know you'd like to go. Uh, it'd be great if you could go to your CVS and get tested. Yeah. You that know. that actually could happen. It does happen in some places, but yeah, it could happen that. if there were enough tests and if they had made arrangements for that sort of thing. Hmm. We have had that, although I haven't been there for a test in a while. But but then they started to sell the home tests, but then mm -hmm. they realized, of course, well, but we also need room for the Russell Stover candies. So they don't have a lot of tests. And then they sold out right. when everybody said, oh, yeah, I'm going to need some of these. 
Right, exactly. And, you know, it's it's, uh, th- thing, there's some other know. things about the testing as well, you know, that Michael Mina, one of our testing experts, points out. Oh. And that is uh, part of the time frame for what it means when you get tested. Hmm. Right. If you get uh, if you're that guy that went to the emergency room in order to get tested so you can go see grandma yeah, not me. and knock her off because you picked it up when you were in the emergency room, you feel safe. Because you got that negative test, and that's an obvious example of what the negative test doesn't mean you're really negative. Right. You're not. You're just not positive. It, it was yet. done in time for that you're night, but wrong. too soon to really tell you what was going on tomorrow. Sure. So in a lot of ways, the home rapid test, also known as a lateral flow test or an antigen test, oh. those tests uh, will tell you what's going on right now, but it won't tell you what's going on later. And so there's this window because they're less sensitive than the PCRs, hmm. where they pick up the uh, Omicron presence probably in a more practical way than the PCRs do. That is to say, if you're positive on a home test, on a rapid test, on yeah. a lateral flow test, you're probably infectious. Okay. Well, sure. I would and then that. as the level drops off and it can't pick it up anymore, you may still have it, and you may be able to catch that on a PCR test, but you're not infectious anymore. Hmm. Okay, I so, see. So the rapid test is very practical. And the rapid test is, is the way to go for the mass population while they're in the, in the middle of a pandemic surge. Mm-hmm. Not have. the PCR, which takes a whole lot longer and is, quote, more accurate, end quote, except for the fact that sometimes it's not. That's the other thing that Michael <laughs> made. It is, but it often is not. Well, people were writing in and saying, I don't understand that I got a positive test on my rapid uh-huh. and a negative test on my PCR. And Josh Marshall asked Michael Mina, the expert, is it possible that the PCRs aren't like all the same? <laughs> That some oh. are better than others. All right. I'm and Michael Mina question. said, wow, you're the first person to ask me that in two years. It's a great question. The answer is they are absolutely not the same. Some of them suck. Oh. I'm some of them are being done those. by machines, by robots. Some are done by humans. Some are skilled. Some are less skilled. They're not all the same. And they don't always give you the right answer. They're the gold standard oh. because they have the capability of being the most accurate. But that doesn't mean that every, any individual test on any individual occasion is going to be uh, correct. Okay. And, if and so going, if your rapid it. test says you're positive and your PCR says you're negative, you're positive. Okay. Well, I, I think the rapid tests positive, are the way to go. Positive. The rapid tests are what you should use. But the rapid test may take a few days after exposure before they turn positive. That's why the two in the box. Yes. And so the way you're supposed to use it, two in a box per one person, yeah. you're supposed to use one on Monday and one on Wednesday. Right. And then if you're negative, then you're negative. That's not how people use it. You got two people in the house. Let's say you're, a, you're an old married couple with nobody in, in, in the house but you. Let's say that. You're doing one. The other one's doing the other. Then you go see grandma. Yep. That's how people are using it. Oh, and do you report those tests the way you're supposed to? No. No. I'll report a negative. You got to go online for that. I don't know how to go online. Oh. Can you do it? Can you go online? Yes. And yes. Okay. There's a, a website for that. All right. Well. But nobody does. If I get the COVID, so, I'll figure so, out. So, you know, the they were hoping is. that it would be like sort of semi automatic that they would use those to help track what's going on. They can't. They were hoping that people would use it the way they told them. Actually, the way people you're using them is sensible. These things are like gold. You can't get them. Right. <laughs> and so, for uh, one single person to split the test and use it for like two people at the same time because I want to know what to do tonight isn't a terrible idea, even though that's not how it was meant to be. That's okay, not at all unreasonable, and you can't expect people not to do that. Yeah, just like I mean, you it can't expect people not to go to the emergency room to get their test uh, when you've told them it's I really important like to, to get tested. Them to do that, though, I, that I, wanna, I would like to push them to stop doing. But yeah, the home. So testing. would I, but you just told them it was really important to get tested. Ah, uh, you, you, you right, we're all going to fly. We're all going to go. You know, travel. It's a big travel day. Yeah. Get tested before you go. It's really important. Well, it was the only way I could do it. Well, you know. News at 11, I, I, my segment's over. Sorry, I have to do this feel-good thing about this dog that really, you know, licked somebody so much they smiled. And that was wonderful, but I didn't have room to tell you, oh, mm. and don't go to the emergency room. Yes. All right, well, I'll get back to that next time. Well, this is what you have this show for. Uh, yeah, I imagine a lot of these tests are being used uh, in that fashion. You, It's better than nothing. So you do it, and you say, what did I buy these things for if not to do it for these occasions? Uh, I, 
of course, you know, then maybe, maybe, maybe you remind yourself the next time, yes, okay, actually, I did this so that I would do this a few days before the next occasion, and then on the day of the occasion as well. Uh, but it is annoying, right? You only have a limited number of them, and you we have a limited use two we don't have enough to tests. go to So every I interrupted Andy Slavich to bring you this popcorn. important rant. Uh, yeah. But you know, uh, to get back to him, and we'll yeah. finish this after the break because that's coming up. Hospitals are still going to be swamped because enough people will still get sick, let alone showing up because they're worried. Well, the number one thing you can do to protect yourself is to get boosted. Yeah. But even with three shots, there'll still be plenty of breakthrough infections that generally don't lead to being hospitalized or that some label mild, as Craig Spencer did. Now, the very definition of mild is problematic and in the eye of the beholder. Right. Apparently, some people are reporting from South Africa, for example, you don't lose your smell and taste as often with Omicron as you do with Delta. Hmm. But it still can happen. Just like you can still wind up in the hospital if you don't have a vaccination. So potential loss of smell and taste, symptoms that linger, and the ability for anybody to spread COVID make mild a problematic description. All right. All right. And a population, and here's the key thing as we go into the break, a population where many feel personally safer Mm -hmm. would cause many to let their guard down and increase spread. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Yes, definitely true. A lot of guards are down. What happened to the guards? They all passed but, down. You know, if you uh, reduce, if you let your guard down, it still adds up to a horrible number of deaths. Uh, and yes. we'll deal with that after the break. Okay, right. So, I mean, I definitely feel that too. And, uh, you know, there was a time during the summer when it seemed like uh, maybe we would be over this stuff. Restrictions were dropped. And well, now you they could have go to outside. Right, true. But even then, uh, it was there was just less spread. And because people were outside, then they started dropping mask mandates. Maybe not a great idea. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the K Grown in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Or at least we think it is the K Grown in the Morning Show. We'll tell you for sure in three days when we get the results of our second test back. But for right now, we're positive that this is the show and ready to continue on. Is there more pandemic news to cover? Or is everybody sick already? Is that it? No, there's, there's still plenty of stuff to okay. cover here. So right. Andy Slavit yeah. wasn't done. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, he says the very nature of a variant that so easily Mm -hmm. spread leads many to feel like we have to enter a more sustainable state of lower restrictions. Uh, Oh, okay. People want to, people just want to say, all right, if it's mild, I'll, I'll just do nothing. That's a bad thing. I'll get it. That perpetuates the lax response and drives down the use of low hassle measures like mask wearing. Yes. Like mask wearing shouldn't be something to overly fight about. There's a couple of things you need to do. You need to up your mask game. Yes. And get a better mask. Those cloth masks, you know, have run their course. It's with Omicron time to up it to an N95 or semi-equivalent. All right. And you can get them. They're around. You can buy them through Project 95, which is a nonprofit. You can get them through Amazon. Uh, the uh, CDC maintains a list of uh, what's a good mask. We talked the other day about that. You can get them. All right. Public health guidance changes as the science does. Incubation periods, vaccine recommendations, boosters, types of masks get thrown up in the air with time and viral evolution. And these changes cause them to lack trust the guidance because it changes. And it makes others think that the guidance is hopelessly behind. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. 
uh, uh, Trump people look at the CDC and their mask guidance and say they've been wrong since the beginning. And I look at CDC and say, you really need to change it so that you understand that people really should be wearing N95s. Yeah. So uh, we can't know the future, he says. Will Omicron infection protect against new variants? In other words, if you get it, then does it uh, – so many people get it that we mm. really do reach herd immunity through Omicron. We might. And how often will vaccinations be recommended? We have to make decisions and policy with this real uncertainty. You know, I hate to tell you Don Rumsfeld was right. Uh, we have known unknowns and we have uh, unknown unknowns. And it sounded stupid at the time and everybody made fun of him, but he's right. Uh Yes. It's the one single thing in his entire career he was right about. I guess that's true. The very nature of these contradictions requires more nuance than most public health communicators are capable of. Because there are a few absolutes. And I'm okay. certain that there are a few absolutes. <laughs> How sure are you? Uh, totally, I'm pretty sure. All right. More or less. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, well, you know. Today How did your assertiveness training class go? Well, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? As a result, we're all processing things through our own individual circumstances and attitudes. For example, many people will know dozens more people positive with COVID than very sick from COVID. And particularly for many younger ones, it's not a surprise that many are ready to move on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? And, you know, I keep in touch with a lot of progressive people who have gotten vaccinated and boosted. And some of the people we both know. Mutual friends have gotten sick this time, but not very sick. Yeah, that's what's going on. Right. That's... And so if you were looking at that, you'd say, well, you know, it doesn't look that bad. Right. So uh, that's people, the though. thing you get. Well, it doesn't look that bad. But if you have a family with an organ transplant, it's in that indifference could be lethal. And if yes. your hospital's well, getting overwhelmed, as I read at the very beginning of the first segment, that's bad. So personal circumstances, young, old, vaxxed, unvaxxed, immunocompromised, salaried versus front line. That is to say the executive who can work from home, who tells all the staff they have to go in because it's retail. Right. Already touched by COVID in school, apart from the family, have as much to say about how these contradictions are interpreted as some absolute truths and attitudes Uh toward science, toward government, toward faith, toward what you believe to be your obligation to others in society even more sharply define how people interpret the data they hear. So this accounts for the presence of three prevailing sentiments. Okay. Yeah. There's two right. absolutes. One is it's inevitable. We're all going to get it. I feel the like other that. is we have to go for zero COVID like they do in, uh, uh New Zealand, mm. New Zealous. Yes. Okay. And while in conflict, both can find a basis in fact, and both promote different prescriptions. So it's rainy or it's sunny could per- persist if we end up with a virus that doesn't end up killing in high percentages, but is way worse than a common cold. Mm. And the more who feel safe, the less safe for those who aren't. So policy decisions become increasingly challenging. The it's inevitable thinking isn't 2020 herd immunity crowd. People in this camp who Delta and Omicron is nearly impossible to contain and high unvax rate is immutable. Yes. So uh, South Africa. Policy approaches here call for a lighter touch. For example, recommend boosters only for those at high risk and when they prevent hospitalization. uh, But do it because you're telling people you need to get boosted so you don't get hospitalized. It's not going to stop you from getting sick. They haven't said that. No, there's been us. We're saying that. Yeah, but they haven't. You know, and and again, I've I've made the point on the show for weeks and months now that they've been really dancing around what are the vaccines for? Hmm. Are they to keep you out of the hospital? Yes, everybody agrees with that. There's consensus. Are they to stop you getting sick? Well, we hope so, but it doesn't. We don't want to say that. But if we say that it might, then more people will get it because they don't want to get sick. They don't care about being in the hospital. They don't think hmm. they ever will be. Yes, but the hospital matter, you know, and that's the debate that public health people have. And yeah. uh, critics view this debate as giving up and damning people to die. That's not what it is. It's a legitimate debate to get both points of view because both points of view are correct. Mm. Okay. So zero COVID was a prevailing 2020 view for complete containment. Uh, you know, that wasn't really terribly heavy. Mm-hmm. Many still see this as the right, most humane answer, Andy Slavitt says, but most people don't because it's impossible. Those who do can point out to the outrageously high death count, many who can't be protected, long COVID. But critics ask for how long and how realistic. 
and many feel in between accepting some level of uneasy ambiguity and deciding day to day. I would say that's most of us. So take calculated risks for priorities like school and family, and I would add for the holidays and for grandma who's on oxygen, because maybe next year she won't be here. Okay. Test frequently, because she still smokes, you know. So test frequently so as not to expose others, and just do it smart and don't go to the emergency room to do it. Mm. Wear masks in crowds, and I would add wear better masks, but at least wear a mask. Okay. And check local conditions and adjust. And by the way, local conditions are horrible right now, and you should know that. <laughs> check local conditions. They're awful. Oh, my yeah, God. Exactly. All right. This approach Let's respects check. that data is evolving and also that the virus appears fit enough to last, but it can feel like extended limbo. It makes policy responses more uncertain. Boosters whenever they wane, vaccinations, mass travel. Any approach for addressing COVID is open to criticism because the pandemic doesn't present the opportunity for perfect answers. And by the way, those answers will change, Mm -hmm. I would add. He says criticism is often warranted, particularly people like me in the public arena. But attacks on those with honest disagreements are way too common. It's easier to find a graph or study to retweet that reinforces a view that's to grant the nuance to and validates and doesn't validate opposing Mm views. So as of today... Those who see Omicron as milder are just as right as people who see it as more dangerous. For me, Andy Slavitt, my baseline is to advocate for policies that favor those with the fewest choices. So require vaccines when in crowds, preserve antivirals for immunocompromised because we don't have enough of them, support frontline healthcare workers by reducing spread, and certainty seems like the only sure mistake. Hmm. I'm certain he's right. More I'll, or less. I'll bet on it. How's that? Yeah, so that's pretty good. Uh, okay. So, you know, that's basically what's going on here. It's it's real. It's serious. It's enough to overwhelm the hospitals. It's probably not going to be individually as bad as Delta, but that doesn't mean that it's okay. You don't need to do anything. You need to do some things. The more some things you do, the more help it'll be. The one person who got a home test and didn't travel for the holidays and didn't give it to five other people who gave it to five other people to five other people – Makes a big difference. You're a hero. Exponential threat. You are a hero. Uh, but you can't get enough tests. And I, that I fault the Biden administration for it. They should have known. Mm, and they yes. should have been on this. And they should know about masks and they should be on that too. And they're not. Hmm. Yeah. I think that seems fair. But on the other hand, you know, they're legitimately trying. They're not evil people. They're not <laughs> trying to kill you like the last group. Ah, that's a very big difference it's a quantum difference between the two there's i you know i'm trying my best but i'm not very good at it versus i don't give a damn one way or another you should get it okay i i i like the other one uh so i think uh all of that is important i'm sending you a graph from right. this ashish cha uh graph thread is. which is about uh hmm. you know the practical aspects of okay you know somebody who's infected what do you do now So uh, as Omicron cases explode, he says, we need a strategy for isolating folks who test positive. Especially if they'll explode. And we think we need to think about the purpose (laughs) of isolation, because if we don't get it right, it'll be hugely disruptive and won't keep us safe. So what do you need to do? Why ask people to isolate? Well, it's obvious you don't want them spreading it. So what we care about is how contagious you are. That's where those lateral flow home tests come in. They pick up contagiousness, as we talked about. We want folks to isolate when they're contagious. Mm -hmm. And so when are people contagious? Well, it varies a lot, right? So how long folks are contagious depends upon two things. When you did the test, like if you went to the emergency room yes, and you tested negative because you want to go see grandma, but then you don't feel well a couple of days later, when do you do your next test? Hmm. Did you get your next test as soon as you started to feel bad? So you're early in the phase of when you're infected? Or did you wait a week because you said, I was traveling anyway. I got tested before I went. I'll do it next week. And then by the time you get your positive test back, you're already feeling better. Ah. So how long you're infectious, how long you're contagious, are different for those two people. The guy who got it the day he started to feel sick is going to be contagious for you know four or five days the guy who got it just as i was starting to feel better probably for a day or so hmm. well you were 
con- probably contagious for about the same amount of time. You just didn't right. Know you just didn't know it. But so, what do you do from the time you actually had confirmation? I go home. So take the average person in the average circumstance who tests PCR positive today. How long will they be contagious? Uh, about two days. Okay. Some five, and on occasion ten. And because on occasion ten, the CDC says isolate for ten days, but that's rare. It's usually five, and so most people should isolate for five days. That's what they're telling people these days, I think. Yeah, remember, quarantine is, I don't know if I'm sick, isolate is, I am sick, how long do I stay away from people? Ah, okay. All right. And that's why that graph that I sent you, which shows you when the lateral flow home test picks you up, Hmm. basically picks you up during the infectious period. Yes. Right? And after that, it doesn't pick you up. Uh, so basically, the lateral test says you're infectious. And if the lateral test is negative, you're probably not infectious, even if you have it. Okay, so the lateral great. test is great. Well, we're for them. Right. You're probably infectious one or two days before you turn positive. Mm. And you're probably infectious for oh, one, two, three, four, five days after. So five days is a pretty good rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. In terms of how long you have to isolate yourself for. The graph shows the infectious period is about five days. And he same, came to the same conclusion I did, looking at the graph there. But it can be longer, and that's why CDC defaults to 10. But here's the thing. 10 uses the mental model that's either people test positive early or have symptoms uh, just as they're starting to get infected. But most people and many people have little or no symptoms, especially vaccinated folks. So you can't use that. And many people get tested really, really late. And that's why a lot of studies show that the PCR super accurate tests that pick up everything Hmm. have low viral load positives. They're testing positive, but they're not contagious anymore. Yes. Okay. Think think the NBA. Uh, What do we think about the NBA test? Oh, that guy just played for three and a half hours. He looked great. He scored, you know, 50 points. He was a beast. He just tested positive. Well, I don't feel sick. Well, it's because you're not sick. Yeah. Right. You know, you're you're not even contagious. Yes. We had well, a ton of those. And, right. you know, so so sports teams were closing down left and right from PCR tests, which were probably oversensitive. Hmm. So we've seen that in the real world. So what do you do? A simple workable solution. Five days of isolation and a negative antigen test. You can go back to work. Okay. And that's what the CDC just said was good for healthcare workers. And Ashish Jha is saying, shouldn't just be healthcare workers, should be everybody. Okay. You shouldn't have a 10 day isolation for regular people and five days for healthcare workers. No, probably not. But that's what they have right now. Oh, well, no wonder things suck. So it should be like five days for everybody. Oh, all right. Well, that'll make people less afraid to report that they're positive, less worried about taking the tests. So isolating COVID plus people, COVID positive people, are all about stopping transmission. Mm -hmm. And we don't really have to guess. We have antigen tests. I know not enough, but they're coming. That's one of the things Biden said he was going to fix. So five days and a negative antigen test should be enough to end isolation. Not just for healthcare workers, for moms and dads getting back to kids, hourly workers who don't get paid when they're home. Really, he says, for anybody who doesn't want to be isolating when they don't need to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's so the direction we need to go. And that's the clear message that really ought to come out of CDC. All right. Well, let's get on it. And hey, it's just science, you know. Right. Pass those tests out. Uh, they've been doing a great job elsewhere. Some places around here as well. Apparently in D.C. you can get tests for free at the local libraries, which uh, I guess makes the local library uh, also a place you don't want to hang out a great deal, just like the uh, hospital. But the wait time is a lot Shorter, I think, at the uh, library. So, yeah. okay, pick up your tests, wear your mask when you do. Well, you know, in general, libraries are wonderful institutions, which really ought to be supported a lot more than they are. Yes. That's another story for another day. Right. Pretty soon people will, you know, get your masks before or your uh, tests before uh, right-wingers start showing up to burn them because that's they were going to the library to burn things anyway, and then they hit your masks and they hit your tests. Get them in your hands. And, uh, yeah, get them now. Get them before you need them. Don't don't forget that's the thing to do. You want to have them on hand, uh, and so that you can do things like, well, in a couple of days, I'm going to this important event, and I should test myself now, 
and then uh, keep another test on hand if you do get sick so that after five days you can see whether you have a ticket out of your house or not. Right. So my advice, take it for what it's worth, is if you go and you – let's say you're shopping online – Let's say that. And you see, oh, I can't get this test tomorrow or the next day like I'm used to. It'll take two weeks. Go ahead and order it. Yeah. Um, Stock up. Mm. Yeah, you there know, was a don't, period don't, during don't the... Don't hoard, but if you were oh. thinking of buying two boxes or a box, get one. Get two. Yeah. And if it takes two weeks or a month, get them anyway. Just have them in the house because by the time they come, you might want them at that point. Yeah. And at that point, you might have trouble getting them. There was a period during the summer when, you know, in ordering those things, and if it was going to take a while, I, you know, I, at least I thought, well, you know, some chance, I guess things are just getting better. But if I order these things and they show up and then it's all over and I don't need them. Yeah, okay, well, it's possible, I guess, but... Uh, right, they're 30 bucks. If you can't afford it, great. You know, wait for Biden to send you a free one or, yeah. you know, get yeah, one some other way or get happen. reimbursed by your insurance company. There's, there's a number of different ways you can deal with that. Right. But if you have the means and the wherewithal to get one, then get if one. You do, yes. And if you have the way, the means uh, to get some and give people who, who don't a couple tests, do that too. Sure. I mean, like I, I, I did the same with masks. I have extra mm -hmm. N95s. Mm -hmm. They give out yes. to my neighborhood. Uh, okay. You know, I, I have an 84 year old neighbor who is traveling to Cali to to Florida. Good because idea. Because they have to see yeah. a grandchild for various and sundry reasons, but they have to go. They're 84. Okay. They've been vaccinated. So I gave her some of my extra masks and said, you know, where are these? these? Where right. are? You? Will she? I don't know. <laughs> but you know, the reason you have extra is so you can help your neighbors. Right. Bring them on the plane. Put them on there. Uh, you know. I read about the uh, when the after the CEO got sick, and they they had come to present that report saying the air Southwest on, Airlines, the guy yeah. who was coughing during his whole presentation, <laughs> yeah, exactly. probably got everybody in Congress sick. Yeah, and it probably flew there on a private jet too. By the and way. a lot anyway. of people in Congress they get sick. Yeah, they did. They're all over the place now. And I figure it was that back thing. in our uh, back in their home states, getting other people sick there. Unfortunately, yeah, it probably but flew southwest. I did find out about that, and they said, you know, the air on the planes. Oh well, you know, we recycle. You know, the air through the filters, uh, change the. Full it's cabin better than air you might think. But still not yes, great. it's true. Um, not not bad. Uh, and they were talking about that. You know, well, during flight, you know, that's uh, very little. Need even for masks. I don't know if I buy that. Why not keep it on? Sure, take it off to eat. But still, then they realized um, a, a lot of time that people spend sitting on planes, they spend sitting on the tarmac or at the gate, boarding, deplaning, waiting through delays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And during all of that time, the air supply on the planes then is provided from the ground and uh, the hookup at the gate, not through the heap of filters on the plane and that's just right so in other words if your wi-fi on your phone doesn't work you're probably you know breathing in uh, polluted air mm. <laughs> i guess uh although well let's see uh, if you're doing the in-flight wi-fi i guess then uh, then once you're up in now, the once, air, once you're, you're up fine. you're fine yeah. you know then but uh, people who uh, this is whole article about the reception that people get at airports mm. and it's pretty good in the airport because they have these small uh yeah. but uh, frequent uh, uh antenna Yes. All over the place. So the whole airport's covered. So while you're there, you're fine. But later, but, you it, but once you start to get on the tarmac or you're in that waiting area, yes, I see. it's terrible. Usually. Because the little tiny, uh, 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 the little tiny antenna don't reach that far and you're yeah. not on in-plane Wi-Fi yet. Right. So in that gap, that's when it's you're... awful. And that same gap is probably the same gap that you're breathing in terrible air. Probably true. So you, can, you can't can even text your friends, I'm getting COVID right now. So wear your mask because then you won't have to to, to text them that. And then right. Anyway, speaking of science, problem. another thing that happened Something. over the weekend yeah. is uh, the James Webb Space Telescope launched successfully. Uh -huh. Wonderfully successful launch that you get to watch because this camera is on the booster. So you get to see the thing, hmm. which looks like a cardboard cutout against a really cheap <laughs> you know, uh, a picture of Earth that uh, somebody put out, but it was just a gorgeous, wonderful uh, launch. And mm -hmm. the thing is just so complex. I was reading the story from space.com, which we're Space. was covering this fairly in detail. Yes. The James Webb Space Telescope James Next Webb, Steps. Though, 
Yeah. And just here's some amazing factoids, you know, which have to warm the cockles of your heart if you're an engineer and have cockles. Yeah. Uh, two to three months cold, after launch, maybe. for instance, it says, yeah. the team will align the primary mirror segments so they act as a single light collecting surface. Yes. Right? This will be painstaking and time consuming work because the mirror has to be perfect to an accuracy of 150 nanometers. That's There's different segments that all have to align. And per perspective, a sheet of paper is 100,000 nanometers. What? All right. One of our scientists calculated that we move these mirrors literally slower than grass grows. <laughs> so I take so long, I guess. Yes. Wow. So it's just like, and yet, if they can pull this off, amazing. It is, uh, and highly technical. I also understand it's going to take them something like six months in order to get the unit in shape to start making these moves apparently uh, i guess it has to cool down for some period of time i can't believe it takes that long but well it's an amazing marvel of technology it's a little confusing because it's the uh, the web and then i'm thinking of the other one is the hubble and then i'm thinking well web hubble what that was the guy from whitewater right i'm very confused by the namings well but, web wasn't that guy who was like a democrat but a republican but a democrat who yeah ran for there was president james or web, something? the right to that too not not named for him i guess but uh, it's just uh i don't know i don't know who james webb was the thank you don't... nasa coordinator See. Under JFK. Ah, all right. He was the 20th person to take the job when JFK decided that we were going to the moon. Hmm. The first 19 said, you're crazy, I'm not doing this. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. And, and he took the job and he got it done. All right. Well that's done. Why you should have some, yeah. That makes oh, good that sense. It wasn't then. during Kennedy's time, obviously. It came after. But, you know, the whole time well, these things that he was – when he took over – NASA was this backwater, nobody uh, respected it kind of agency. Hmm. And in his time came to be known for like, they do everything right. Cool. Well, I guess he must have been good at it. And deserves so that, having that's a why it's telescope named after, named after him. Okay. You know, him. Thank you. Because it was and then the last thing couldn't have been uh, the before guys. we go. Uh, I'm supposed to look these things up before the show. So I look like I always knew that. Like I, I just found that out like three minutes ago. All right. um, but uh, don't try this at home. You know, don't tell people Test that you just you just learned this. this. Uh, pretend that you always knew this. Yeah, right. I know. Reporters do it all the time. <laughs> OK, so uh, this is a piece in Daily Beast. I know. Trump flack cooperates Trump flack. with January 6th committee and then hits the brakes. Oh, that sounds familiar. All right. Who's it this? should sound familiar because the reason I'm highlighting this particular piece, even though this may or may not be an important thing, is because the contours of what you'll see and what you are seeing already, yes. like with uh, sounds Mark Meadows. Sounds Despite all the bluster from Team Trump railing against the committee, a new lawsuit reveals the former Flack had been quietly cooperating with investigators. Mm -hmm. His name is Taylor Budowich. He's turned over more than 1,700 pages of material and testified under oath before the committee for four hours. Really? Okay. I you would know it. Okay. And you wouldn't know it because they didn't talk about it. But then what happened I is on know. Christmas Eve, Budowich and his lawyers sued the committee members, House Speaker Pelosi, and the bank J.P. Morgan Chase. What? They – he – they want to block investigators' attempts to seize information about him from the financial institutions. Oh. Name okay. JP so here's the thing. Okay. Hmm. All right. The January 6th committee is investigating what happened on January 6th. One of the things yes. that they're investigating is who paid for all this stuff. Ah. Yeah. So people like Budowich and others have basically said, okay, we'll cooperate. You ask for documents. I'll give you my daughter's wedding invitation i'll give you this letter i wrote to my grandmother that has nothing to do with it i'll give you thousands of them mm. but the committee wants relevant stuff yes of course and budowich and his lawyers are saying well we gave you these thousands of documents we cooperated why are you <laughs> you know what do you want so they did and the committee said well actually we have reason to believe, based on what other people told us, you were involved with financing the thing 
on January 5th and 6th. And we would like information on that. And we also want your bank records. Yeah. And the people like me to which go, holy crap. You found out what I was doing and you noticed that the stuff I gave you was all garbage. And now you want the real Mm. stuff. I'm suing you. (laughs) Okay. I won't do it. I'm no longer cooperating. So you never were. so this guy and like half a dozen other guys have done the same thing. Once it got to the bank accounts Mm. and or the texts uh, from Verizon where you were communicating with people, it's like, oh, I didn't know you had that. I'm not cooperating anymore. Yeah. Wow. And it's pretty amazing when you look at it. That is, uh, and uh, you know, a good another good lesson in just how they drag everything out. There's, it's not just but, Trump but who not says all appeal. They're dragging everything. it out. It's not like a strategy for delay. Oh. It's I'll mm-hmm. give you whatever you want as long as it's not relevant. But as soon oh. as you find out what relevant stuff is, and you come after me for that, I'm no longer cooperating. Yes. And well, the other side of it like is, and this is where it would be irresponsible not to speculate. Let's do it. Okay. Budowicz is suing the committee in part, he claims, because he was so ticked off the investigators went to the bank to try to get additional information about the payments he himself disclosed. Okay. The select committee's deceptive tactics to ambush Mr. Budowicz and deprive him of meaningful opportunity to object to the production of personal financial records demonstrates a lack of good faith by the select committee. Well, two obvious problems for Budowicz come up right away. Right. Number one. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not playing one on the internets, but just even to a lay person, two obvious things come up. And obvious thing number one is he lied to the committee, and now they found out that he actually did pay for a lot of this stuff. He yeah. was the conduit from when it came. And the other is, you want my records, you're going to see what I paid my mistress. And <laughs> nobody knows about that. You're not <laughs> supposed to know about that. Well, I'd like to know. Or the illegal drug deals, or the, or the you know, the offshore thing no, I had, I did the, you know, in the Caribbean. You're not supposed to know about that stuff. Okay. Well, we won't tell anybody once we find out. We are only interested in uh, what you paid for on January 6th. And the dates are... That's very interesting. Uh, I, I think it could be a delay tactic, uh, but I'll tell you later. All right, welcome back now to the Kate Gordon Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. That is an interesting story. I like that. I wish I had... Uh, I'll read through that more thoroughly, perhaps, uh, after the show. But I like the idea. Uh, I don't. It's also interesting if they weren't thinking of it as a delaying tactic. It makes an excellent delaying tactic. You should try it out. I don't know. I guess if you're being uh, investigated by the committee. That's just, you know, straight up, uh, just interesting... Uh, and very Trumpy thing to do, right? Well, we want people to cooperate. Well, I'll cooperate. We need documents from you. I'll give you documents. They just not not the documents that you want. Okay. Well, then we want to specifically have the documents that we were asking for. Oh, well, that no, I'm not cooperating with that. I see what you mean. No, reminiscent of maybe what happened with Meadows, but then they got the Meadows information nonetheless. Anyhow, although uh, he used the opposite tactic. Uh, you want these documents i guess i will give them to you and then suddenly realized uh actually i gave away relevant documents i should stop doing that these guys were smarter they gave away irrelevant documents and then stopped cooperating all right let's see a couple of stories to share with you there are very many some are catch-up stories some are long reads i might have to wait until later and uh, let's see i'll save this one for tomorrow in case we can talk to joan because it has to do with the filibuster and maybe we'll save this one and the judges and uh let's try this one because this is uh we were just out of the well i guess we're still in the christmas period here and i got this interesting piece through my my twitter pal uh famed acclaimed author peter manso pete manso uh, took a very great interest early on in the gun fail series and then went on uh, or was already on to working on his book on sort of a, a historical view of gun fail, melancholy accidents. Remember that one? Anyway, been following him since then on Twitter and uh, still has an eye on guns. And he's also, by the way, very interesting thesis that he's got and is constantly working on. And you'll find that he's uh, refining it at all times and reporting on uh, writing articles about the nexus between, um, well, the, the the greater far-right lean 
of the Republican Party, the insurrection, some of the you know more egregious violations along the way, and evangelicalism and sort of this relationship, in particular lately, um, the the um, how did he put it? Sort of like the the theological element of January sixth, I guess is maybe how we would put it. I don't know how he would put it. He'd have a much more organized and elegant way of putting it. But at any rate, he's focusing back on the guns, but also with a little flavor of January 6th and political violence in it. In this piece he published recently, how recently? Uh, Not all that recently, December 14th. We already knew what was going on for Christmas season by then, though. Why so many guns on Christmas cards? He's talking about uh, the phenomenon uh, revived... It's been around for a long time, but revived in the news most recently by the uh, Christmas card from Tom Massey, congressman from Kentucky, in which every member of the family is holding some uh, long gun weaponry, some of them longer than others. And, uh, you know, then a number of others came out with similar cards. So, yeah, why so many guns on Christmas cards? And the answer in the headline is, because Jesus was, quote, manly and virile. How does this one come to this conclusion? Well, start with crazy, add guns, and then add a pathetic need to justify those guns. And that's basically how you'll get there. But a more hmm, sensitive view of it, perhaps, is uh, no doubt related in the article. The subheader, by the way, reads, Muscular, uh, not muscular, but that's the degeneration that we're talking about. But muscular, which can also degenerate, but muscular Christianity. Muscular Christianity is something totally different. Muscular Christianity, what is it? Well, with scriptural interpretations that can favor stand your ground over turn the other cheek, this muscular Christianity actually has a long tradition in the United States. And you're about to learn about that tradition. Thanks to Peter Manso. Um, who, by the way, credited here in the Washington Post in this little blurb as curator of American religion at the Smithsonian and the author of 10 books, including the forthcoming novel, The Maiden of All Our Desires, which may or may not have anything to do with any of this stuff, but it's what he's up to. And if you like his writing and you feel like a novel instead, uh, if you feel like a novel, Go to the emergency room, tell them immediately. But if you would like to read a novel, you could get his, for instance. And uh, no money from that comes to us. How do you like that? When two members of Congress recently shared images of their well-armed families, I don't know how well really armed, but they were armed, families gathered in front of Christmas trees, many assumed it was merely an act of provocation, a loaded gesture designed to exasperate opponents and excite reporters. You'll recall that the uh, Massey Christmas photo was circulated about two days after the most recent large and splashy school shooting. There's probably been six since then. We just haven't heard very much about them. But the one in in Oakland County, Michigan. And remind me, we got to come back to Oakland County uh, with a small story later on. I don't see how you can remind me it being radio and everything, but maybe... uh, You find an electronic means of doing it. At any rate, many assumed that this was merely an act of provocation, probably because of the close proximity to the school shooting. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, responding to the photographs posted by Massey and also Lauren Boebert, of course, asked on Twitter, Tell me again where Christ said, use the commemoration of my birth to flex violent weapons for personal political gain. Well, he, he didn't. Others, however, saw in the photo something worth emulating. A week into the controversy, the Republican mayor of Maury County, Tennessee, Andy Ogles, O-G-L-E-S, I don't know if that's really how you pronounce it, but he posted, posted his own fortified family portrait, with fortified, not with nine essential vitamins and iron, but uh, just uh, weaponry. Posted it, of course, to Facebook, because that's where they love it the most. Commenting with a line often and dubiously credited to George Washington, uh, a maybe fake quote, the very atmosphere of firearms anywhere and everywhere restrains evil interference. It doesn't. They deserve a place of honor with all that's good. 
No matter their intended effect, the photos represent a tradition far older than our current penchant for political trolling, one that, like it or not, is part of a widely held part of widely held interpretations of the upcoming holiday, now past, and the beliefs of many who observe it. That is the tradition of muscular Christianity. Do we have any sort of uh, fanfare? No, all we have is like the sad trombone, so that doesn't really fit. Anyway, muscular Christianity. What about this thing? At the heart of both the outrage and the delight inspired by these yuletide pictures was not just a surprising display of firepower, but a common aspect of American religion that is unsettling to outsiders. These photos represent a shift in attitudes among some evangelical Christians that may have broader implications as the previously subtle influences of firearms on faith becomes impossible to ignore. The photographs themselves draw on a trend that stretches back at least a decade. Nevada politician Michelle Fiore, I think we all remember her, I've mentioned her on the show a number of times, shared a similar image in 2015, and even then it was hardly an outlier. Starting in 2010, the Scottsdale Gun Club in Arizona invited patrons, quote, looking for a fun and safe way, I don't know how safe, to express their holiday spirit and passion for firearms, to pose for holiday photos with an arsenal that included pistols, AK-47s, and grenade launchers. Everyone has the right to bear some of those. <clears throat> so that's interesting. Back in 2010, you could take, you, you could, if you didn't have that weaponry, you could come to the Scottsdale Gun Club and borrow it to pose for badass-looking um, Christmas photos, I guess. Then there was the Santa and Machine Guns event that drew crowds and national media attention, resulting in hundreds of Christmas card-ready tableau that caused a stir when they appeared online. By the way, I, uh, I think... Uh, Peter sent this article uh, to me and to everyone, but on Twitter in response to my having driven past the uh, a local gun range yesterday on my trip over the river and through the woods. Um, I passed Clark Brothers Guns in, where are they, like Opal, Virginia or thereabouts. Um, at any rate, uh, you know, locally famous gun shop, been there forever, pass it all the time. They've got a, a big gun shop and a range. And uh, anyway, outside they have one of those customizable signs where you can put up what's on special, you know, whatever. Get an AK-47, 50% off, whatever it is. This time it read, as we passed it yesterday, uh, it was advertising their Sunday church services on the range. So, like, if you can't wait to shoot your new Christmas gun or something, you know, fairly frequently uh, a thing around here, and you go to the range on Sunday, hopefully to shoot it safely and learn about how to use it safely, etc. cetera. Uh, but you were torn between either, you know, practicing your faith by worshiping a church or shooting the guns. <clears throat> Well, at Clark Brothers, you could do both, you see. You could have a service. I don't know whether there was any shooting during the service. I don't know if you were allowed on the range. Like, could you go if you just said, I'm not interested in the church service. I want to shoot. Would they let you shoot while the service was going on? I don't know. They might have asked you to stop. And then you would be like, but my freedoms. And then you'd kill everybody. Don't know how it worked out. I'm sure it was fine. Anyway, so I got this. And uh, yeah, this makes sense of the weird overlap. In the years since, that is since the, say, 2010, when uh, you could pose with borrowed guns in Scottsdale, in the years since, the marketplace has become crowded with products suggesting that guns are, for many, at least part of the reason for the season. Amazon and Etsy offer hundreds of ornaments and decorations in the shape of revolvers, rifles, bullets, and shell casing, as well as camouflage tactical stockings. That's what it says. It's clickable, too. I'm going to take a look. Tactical stockings for Second Amendment enthusiasts to hang by the chimney with care, although they do almost nothing with care. So I'm sure they do it quite recklessly and aggressively because if anything goes wrong, they can shoot it. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, by the way, owns the Washington Post. It is noted here in parentheses in case... 
you thought it was somehow less than perfect disclosure to accuse Amazon and Etsy of offering all those gun-shaped ornaments without noting that he owns the post, but I guess that's the way they handle it. Let me look at these tactical Christmas stockings. Ah, very interesting. So it is vaguely stocking-shaped, you know, uh, like all novelty stockings, right? You know, they're no longer, they don't have anything to do with the uh, practical use as footwear. They're vaguely stocking shaped but you know they're decorative and this one is in fact camo and uh but yeah it's made up to look like uh like uh, you know kevlar vests or thing lots of straps and pockets and a american flag patch which i noticed they put on they're not using the um military sleeve flag patch which puts the blue field of stars toward the wearer's front and streaming the stripes backwards, they reverse it because everybody thinks that looks weird. And it's got all sorts of goodies in it. I don't know if they come with the stuff in it or not, but you know, like a little flashlight and a knife. That I think there's like I see like maybe two flashlights and two knives that are into in little strap holders here. And I don't know what that tool is there. That might be a stun gun. There's a regular, just your your basic gun going in the zipper pocket. And eh, it's it's of interest. You should see it. I was wondering what it looked like. Um, just curious. So it also comes in uh, just plain sort of the desert khaki. And then a, uh, I don't know, a flat grayish color of some kind and there's a black one and then there's the camo one but all all cool tactical type looking stuff i guess and uh i don't know i just wondered whether that fit in the same genre as um my favorite most my i guess maybe the previous winner of the most american product award that I had seen in, oh, I don't know, whether it was uh, Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's or one of the, you know, uh, quote-unquote outdoor stores, like where you and I might go outdoors to play, say, tennis, basketball, hockey, or something like that. Outdoor stores aren't really about doing that stuff outdoors. They're about shooting other things that live outdoors. (laughs) That's really what it's about. Or getting on a boat to pull things that live outdoors but in lakes out of the lakes so that you can eat them or take pictures of them and throw them back, whatever you do. Uh, Outdoor, generally about pestering or killing wildlife that lives there. But that's, you know, that's what they got. Anyway, uh, the most American product I had ever seen to that point was, uh, again, camouflage. It wasn't tactical per se in that it wasn't in that, you know, nylon, Kevlar kind of looking stuff. This was, though, a camouflage like naughty mrs claus motif lingerie set so i don't know like a uh, i can't even remember what the hell was in it but you know a you know a, a, a bustier of the camouflage uh material you know and then the uh, for the bodice of it i guess and then and then the fake fur the faux fur trim up at the top now ordinarily a thing that would come in red material and then with the fluffy fur at the top but this was camouflage so this was if you are i don't know what you're trying to do here but you want to be like mostly nude but also blend in with the woods except for the top of you which should look like an arctic fox so I, I'm not sure what, and then you're having sex on top of that. So I don't know what you do with this exactly, but because it was so useless, it was a contender for, you know, the hall of fame of most American products in the, in the world, <clears throat> along with, I guess, Big Mouth, Billy Bass, and now the tactical stocking. By the way, frequently bought together are the tactical stocking shaped like a stocking, and then the tactical stocking clearly made by the same people, outfitted in the same way, put together in the same way, but it is for your dog. And dogs, look, don't be crazy. Dogs don't wear socks. You're going to make the tactical stocking in the shape of a bone, 
Um, no bone in, in the human body or any animal body, really, I think it looks like the t- stereotypical bone with the thing at both ends. But anyway, uh, that's it. You can get your dog the, the bone tactical thing. And it's a good thing, too, because if you get the tactical stocking, your dog will say, are you out of your mind? A tactical stocking for me? I'm a dog. I'm not going to eat any of the stuff that comes out of that. Now, if you shape it like a bone, that's different. Give me 10. But shaping like a stocking, even though I have two more feet than you do, I still don't wear these things. And dogs do wear little booties and everything when they go out in the snow. If you have one of those sensitive dogs that doesn't want to step on the salt, like all dogs, stepping on the salt that might be on the sidewalk later on in winter. But not now because it's 70 degrees. All right. Well, I didn't realize that this was going to take us so far afield. Let's go back to what Peter Manso had to say about the other things that are uh, so typically American. Uh, there we are. Oh, the, uh, the tactical stockings was where we left off. I didn't know they had them for dogs. Like most such merchandise, the Scottsdale photo promotion, remember where that thing 20 minutes ago where you could borrow guns to get your picture taken, was decidedly non-religious, but some condemned it in theological terms even so. To involve machine guns and Santa in a celebration in the birth of Jesus Christ is the worst kind of heresy I can imagine, Democratic State Representative Steve Farley told the Associated Press in 2011, I would suggest that the people who created this read some of the New Testament. Okay, looking for biblical contradictions in these activities is missing the point, though. Religious traditions have never been limited to what texts say, but rather are continually transformed by what people do. For more than a century, American Protestantism has been shaped by the movement known as muscular Christianity, more than a century, which arose to combat expressions of the faith that critics of the time claimed had become bookish, soft, sedentary, and as they judged it then, excessively feminine. Popular publications such as 1912's The Masculine Power of Christ, or Christ Measured as a Man, argued that Jesus was, quote, distinctively manly and virile. I did not realize that. And it was the task of the Christian to be so as well. Muscular Christianity, born in England in the mid-19th century, had humble origins that seem far removed from the excesses of American gun culture. Its most notable expression early on was the Young Men's Christian Association, more commonly known, of course, as the YMCA, which by the 1850s was a global youth movement combining social ministries with wholesome recreation. We believe in muscular Christianity, one advocate of this form of the faith said in 1860. We believe that the minister of muscle, and it's not capitalized or anything, but the minister of muscle will fight a more valiant and stronger battle with the passions and prejudices of men and that saints' bodies, as well as sinners, are none the worse for for an hour at the dumbbells or weights. So even if it doesn't make you any more Christian, what the hell, why not get in shape? You can't argue with that. A somewhat more macho approach found particularly fertile ground in the expanding United States, where it meshed with myths of the frontier yielding to self-reliance and manifest destiny. Theodore Roosevelt was among its most prominent proponents. In 1903, the year he took a tour of 25 western states, he declared, I do not want to see Christianity professed only by weaklings. I want to see it a moving spirit among men of strength. I guess I can understand why that might be the case, right? You don't want a whole world full of uh, uh, Mr. Collinses, say. Anyway, as it traveled... Muscular Christianity broadened to include not only the kind of fitness fostered by the YMCA, but even greater displays of force. Legends of pistol-packing preachers who trekked through the West with, as one of them had said, Bible in pocket, gun in hand, permanently joined evangel- uh, evangelism sorry, to the six-shooter in some corners of the imagination, the American imagination at that. From time to time, this metaphoric connection has been taken literally. 
Since the 1970s, the spread of cowboy churches has taken an approach to worship that began at rodeos and made it available across the country to evangelicals who have never sat atop a horse but are drawn to a Marlboro Man aesthetic. As with guns on Christmas cards, the line between sincerity and performance in such spaces is not always obvious, though it is often clear that their interpretation of scripture favor stand your ground over turn the other cheek. Their facilities often include shooting ranges along with room to rope and ride. As the scholar Kristen Demez chronicles in her recent book, Jesus and John Wayne, how about that? The overlap of places to worship and places to shoot is no accident. Writers on evangelical masculinity have long celebrated the role guns play in forgive. Uh, I'm sorry, in forging Christian manhood. Demez writes, from toy guns in childhood to real firearms gifted in initiation ceremonies, guns are seen to cultivate authentic God-given masculinity. More than 40% of white evangelicals own firearms, far outpacing other religious groups and the general population, according to a Pew Research Center study. In a sense, American evangelical culture is a significant part of American gun culture and vice versa. Neither would be the same without the other. Their entwined influence can be seen in scriptural arguments for bringing firearms to church, as well as on hoodies extolling the trinity of God's gun and Trump worn at the assault on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, which I, guess I told you at the beginning was another of Peter's focuses here. All of this might seem far removed from holiday cards until one recalls that it is Jesus himself who has been proposed as the exemplar of the manly and virile faith found at the root of Christmas trees festooned with ammunition. Long implicit in evangelical understanding of scripture and tradition, the connection between God and guns has lately been finding more visible expression. On December 25th, Christians around the world will remember the birth of an infant often called the Prince of Peace. Some will also celebrate a man they're certain would know how to handle an AR-15, and in this they see no contradiction. Just sort of bringing you up to date on the facts of the state of things here in uh, the United States. I uh, thought that was rather interesting. thought you might uh, find it to be time well spent. Let's see, a couple of other fun things to share that uh, might fit in the next couple of minutes. And then let's see, a few more dismal ones. Let's see, I did mention to you at the end of last week that uh, when we were reading about Mike Flynn, crazy Mike Flynn and his weirdo circle of conspirators, and uh, former military men turned wackos. Uh, I noted that this had happened, but I'll just read it a little bit more fully as we head into our next break. Judge denies Michael Flynn's request for restraining order against that same January 6th committee. They get sued a lot. And it's not working for him and probably won't work for Budowich either. Uh, this is an NBC News report from... December 22nd, just before our Christmas break, the judge said there is no basis to conclude that Flynn will face immediate and irreparable harm, which is needed for the order. That's the basics of it. Lawyers will understand what's happening. The rest of us want to hear the bulk of the article. Pete Williams gets the byline on this one. A federal judge in Florida on Wednesday denied Mike Flynn's request for a temporary restraining order to block subpoenas from the House January 6th committee, compelling him to testify and produce scores of documents. We'll see how well he does with compliance. The judge took action the day after Flynn filed his motion in federal court in Florida, where he lives. U.S. District Judge Mary Scriven of Tampa said Flynn's motion, which was filed Tuesday, failed for two reasons, including a lack of urgency. She noted that the committee postponed Flynn's deposition to a date to be determined, and while the committee's subpoena said he should produce the documents it requested by November 23rd, there's no evidence in the record as to the date by which the select committee now expects Flynn to comply with its document requests. For those and other reasons, Scriven said, there is no basis to conclude that Flynn will face immediate and irreparable harm. 
which is what he would have to demonstrate in order to get that restraining order. So he fails that test. Scriven said Flynn's lawyers also failed to follow the correct procedure for such requests. Federal rules require someone seeking a temporary restraining order to notify the other party or parties, in this case, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the January 6th Committee, or say why the notice shouldn't be required. And Flynn's lawyers failed to do either. An omission that the judge said was fatal to his motion. These guys just don't know how things work. Weird. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and We Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. That wraps it up on uh, Mike Flynn, actually. I mean, it's a short piece, as I said. But uh, I found it interesting just uh, in terms of what we read on Friday, which was, you know, about the rising influence in weirdo conspiracy and Q-type circles that Flynn and his uh, circle of friends have, particularly with respect to their claims about um, the, uh, the ele- you know, what they allege to be the stolen election. and uh, But a lot of their credibility with these weirdos, I mean, I guess it's unshakable faith that they have in these guys, but a lot of their credibility stems from uh, their ability to uh, fall back on their military careers and to say, uh, you know, I'm in a position to have known these awful secrets. I was the keeper of these awful secrets. That's how you can uh, trust what I'm telling you now, even though my job was to keep them secret from you and I'm now revealing them to you. And so therefore I'm terrible at my job. Uh, it doesn't matter. They got the information that they wanted to hear. So they felt like they were insiders too. Um, I, I just, I, I think it's very interesting that, you know, the whole thing for them is supposed to rest on this idea of they know how the world and the systems within it really work. And then they keep failing in all of their lawsuits to file things properly because the reality is that they really don't know how anything works. But, you know, somehow they're supposed to know how all the super secret clandestine stuff works. They just don't know how the open to everyone to understand and clearly stated rules courts in the United States work. But whatever. Just, you know, putting that out there. You shouldn't be listening to them, essentially, is uh, the upshot here. Let's see. What other things do I have to share with you? Well, let's see. Um, I, I suppose we could go over to this. This will fulfill... Uh, no, not a a promise, but uh, at any rate, uh, my mom sent me this one. How do you like this? My mom sent me an article yesterday and said, this would be a good one. For, I don't know whether she meant for the show, but that I should read it generally. But uh, if it's good for me, it's good for you, I think. But she was intrigued by this piece. Maybe you will be too. We'll see whether we get through the whole thing or not here. From the New York Times from uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, Sabrina... Tavernisi writing this interestingly titled piece. First, they fought about masks. Then, over the soul of the city. That sounds very dramatic. Let's give some dramatic music to that. I think that 
think perhaps somewhat less dramatic once you find out what city's soul they were fighting over. It's Enid, Oklahoma, which I suppose gets us to another <laughs> music. There's nothing wrong with Enid, Oklahoma. I'm sure it's a perfectly nice place. But when you hear about this thing, they fought over the soul of the city. Was it, was it New York, Paris, London? New York, London, Paris, Munich? Everybody talks about pop music is the next line. I can't do it without. Uh, but no, it's even in Oklahoma. They have a soul too. And it's important to talk about it. At least Sabrina Tavernisi thinks so. She must have gone to a diner there. And you know how it goes from there. I'm working for the New York Times. I'm in a diner. There's going to be a story. In Enid, Oklahoma, pandemic politics prompted, a lot of alliteration here, a fundamental question. What does it mean to be an American? Whose version of the country will prevail? And I guess clearly it's between people who say there's a pandemic and even in Enid, Oklahoma, you can catch a pandemic and other people who say, uh, I'm proud to be an American. At least I know I'm free, free to not get COVID and not wear this mask. But only one of those two things will come to pass if I if I do both. All right. Well, anyway, if I do uh, try not to wear the mask anyway. And it becomes a freedom thing not to wear a mask as opposed to uh, I don't want to be sick. And so therefore, anyway, what's going on in Enid? The story starts not on December 26th, but on a hot night in July. Whereupon the first summer of the pandemic uh, or during the first summer of the pandemic, Jonathan Waddell, a city commissioner in Enid, Oklahoma, sat staring out at a rowdy audience dressed in red. Why not? They were in the third hour of public comments on a proposed mask mandate. This would be July of 2020. And Mr. Waddell, a retired Air Force sergeant who supported it, was feeling increasingly uncomfortable. And of course, he was an Air Force sergeant. And so like uh, Darwin told you, uh, he's used to getting inoculated against disease so that you don't get it and you can stay in fighting shape and healthy the whole time. And it doesn't really bother him that much that there are uh, medical advances that will protect him from disease that he doesn't want or need to know all that much about. Just give me the shot so I can stay healthy, Doc. But the rest of the country, or at least the rest of Enid, Oklahoma, had been watching Fox News, One American Network, or Newsmax, or Alex Jones. And so they were pretty sure that all the people in the armed forces were stupid unless they were the ones that they were talking about, in which case they're geniuses, even though they had a bunch of vaccines. But this time they knew, because Internet, that this one vaccine was really something bad and they should stay away from it. And everyone knows that they should tell sergeants to kiss my ass. I'm not taking it. I'm not masking and I'm not getting vaccinated. Anyway, let's see. What's up with Jonathan Waddell? He had noticed something was different when he drove up in his truck. So he's like a regular guy. You know, he's no egghead. He drove up in a truck. The parking lot was full and people wearing red were getting out of their cars, greeting one another, looking a bit like players on a sports team. At the me as the meeting began, he realized that they opposed the mandate. It was almost everybody in the room. Ordinarily, nobody would show up at such a thing, but they decided to swamp it so that it would look like the whole town was opposed. The meeting was unlike any he had ever attended in, a, that, in the sense that people showed up for it, really, but in addition that they were angry and pressing about this thing. One woman cried and said wearing a mask made her feel like she did when she was raped at 17. All right. Another read the Lord's prayer and said the word agenda at the top of the meeting schedule seemed suspicious because of course you have a suspicious agenda. Agenda means you have a bad, it's, you know, what's your hidden agenda? Uh, there is none. It's not hidden. It's right there. It says agenda at the top. I know, but hidden is bad. So obviously whatever comes after it is also bad. Hidden agenda. You'll see that it doesn't say hidden there, does it? No, but it does say agenda. That's basically what's going on here. So there you go. A man quoted Patrick Henry and handed out copies of the Constitution. The line is being drawn, folks, said a man in jeans and a red T-shirt. He said the people in the audience had been shouted down for the last 20 years, and they're finally here to draw a line, and I think they're saying, we've had enough. At the end of the night, 
The mask mandate failed, and the audience erupted in cheers, and they all died. But for Mr. Waddell, who had spent seven years making Enid his home, it was only the beginning. He remembers driving home and watching his mirrors to make sure no one was following him. He called his father, a former police officer, and told him what had happened. He said that people were talking about masks, but that it felt like something else. What exactly he did not know. I said, this is honestly just crazy, Dad, and I'm not sure where it goes from here. Hmm. In the year and a half that followed, fierce arguments like this have played out in towns and cities across the country. From lockdowns to masks to vaccines to school curriculums, the conflicts in America keep growing and morphing even without Donald Trump, the leader who thrived on encouraging them, in the White House. But the fights are not simply about masks or schools or vaccines. They are, in many ways, all connected as part of a deeper rupture, one that is now about the most fundamental questions a society can ask itself. What does it mean to be an American? Who is in charge and whose version of the country will prevail? Social scientists who study conflict say the only way to understand it and to begin to get out of it is to look at the powerful currents of human emotions that are the real drivers. They include the fear of not belonging, the sting of humiliation, a sense of threat, real or perceived, and the strong pull of group behavior. Some of these feelings were already coursing through American society, triggered by rapid cultural, technological, demographic, and economic change. They came, Then came the pandemic, plunging Americans into uncertainty and loneliness, an emotion that scientists have found causes people to see danger where there is none. Add to all of that, leaders who stoke the conflict and disagreements over the simplest things can become almost sectarian. Aaron Halperin, a social psychologist at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, in, in Israel, that's, that's where Jerusalem is, who studies emotions in conflict, said that people in intractable fights often do not remember how they started, but that they are perpetuated by a sense of group threat. That seems like a pretty apt thing to study there in Israel. One's group, for example, American or Christian, is an extension of oneself, and people can become very defensive when it or its status in the hierarchy changes. If my American identity is an important part of who I am, and suddenly there's a serious threat to that, then in some ways that means that I don't know who I am anymore, he said. It's an attack on the very core of how I see myself, of how I understand myself. Professor Halperin said he had been surprised to see that the emotions that have powered the conflict in America were just as intense as those he sees between Israelis and Palestinians. That is because in the United States, unlike in Israel, both sides had relatively high expectations of each other, he said, leading to a sharp shock when those who were part of us suddenly do something so counter to our values. In Enid, both sides of the mask debate believed they were standing up for what was right. Both cared deeply for their city and their country, and they believed that in their own way, they were working to save it. And it all started as an argument over simple, a simple piece of cloth. Uh, this next section is called Birth of the Freedom Fighters. One of the first to speak at the city council meeting that night in July was Melissa Crabtree, a homeschooling mother who owns a business selling essential oils and cleaning products. Boy, that sounds familiar. Ms. Crabtree, not the teacher from The Little Rascals, but uh, the one who teaches the kids at home instead, was new to Enid. She had moved two years ago, from, two years before, from Texas, but also new to politics, drawn in by the pandemic. When states enacted sweeping rules like lockdowns, mask mandates, and school closures to combat the spread of illness, she was skeptical. Now, I was skeptical of her because she's a homeschooler, so what does she care if schools are closed? Schools are always closed for a homeschooler. What's the difference? But she's going to, now she's going to be dealing with parents who are homeschooling um, uh, against their will, and she can speak uh, with some authority as a previous homeschooler and say, I understand how difficult it is. Uh, you'll never be able to homeschool as well as me. Buy my essential oils and don't wear your mask. I don't really know how, how she leaps out to this position of leadership on this 
but but somehow she does. The more she researched online, the dumber she got. I would guess, but the sentence actually reads, the more she researched online, the more it seemed that there was something bigger going on. She said she came to the conclusion that the government was misleading Americans. For whose benefit, she could not tell. Maybe drug companies, maybe politicians. Whatever the case, it made her feel like the people in charge saw her and the whole country of people like her as easy to take advantage of. And that's probably true. But they weren't necessarily doing anything about it. But she's probably as pretty easy to take advantage of a person like that. They're, you know, setting themselves up for failure. But okay. Anyway, I don't like to be played the fool, said Ms. Crabtree, who also works as an assistant to a Christian author and speaker. And I felt like they were counting on us, us being the general population, on being the fool. Yeah, she's no fool. She teaches her kids at home, sells essential oils, and works for a Christian author and speaker. You know, all the things you need to do to, to really be up to speed on science. She felt contempt radiating from the other side. You just heard it from me. I, I, I admit to it. A sense that those who disagreed with her felt superior. Yeah. And wanted to humiliate her. Eh, I could do without it, but as long as you're here, sure, I'll humiliate you. She said she was taken aback at how people were ridiculing her on a pro-mask group on Facebook. She said she remembers one person writing that he hoped she would get COVID and die. Certainly, people do feel that way. I had to stop going into that group. That's actually a good decision. Why people are choosing to shame others, I don't know. But she said she thought that fear might be at the root of it. Or must be at the root of it. Uh, could be true. Of course, you could probably make a both sides argument about that. Ms. Crabtree grew up in a highly devout family, no surprise there, with parents who met at a Campus Crusade for Christ conference. The whole family was active in their faith, volunteering at their churches, going on mission trips, holding Bible studies in their home. Her father served in the Air Force and they moved around a lot. As a child, she lived in Germany, Colorado, South Dakota, Ohio, Alaska, and Maryland. Of course, the guy she was you know, booing at the meeting was an Air Force sergeant, but whatever. She accepted Jesus at a backyard Bible club. It's one of the places you can accept them. It's accepted everywhere, like uh, MasterCard. Uh, a backyard Bible club when she was four and has never questioned her faith despite life's hardships, including the mental health struggles of a close family member and years of infertility. Her most traumatic experience being run over by a car in her driveway as a young child, yeah, that'll hurt, reinforced her faith. Why not? The only remaining trace, her left eye does not tear when she cries, is a reminder, she said, of how God spared her on that winter day. I knew that the Lord had a purpose for us and that it was to follow him and glorify him and obey him. She said, I didn't really question that. I didn't feel the need to explore this whole world around me. <laughs> uh, except on the internet and then make conclusions about science for people. But now at 45, she says she believes that Americans broadly and Christians in particular have left too much of the running of the country to a governing class that has taken advantage of power. She blames her parents generation for not talking about religion or politics, a position that she said has led to a loss of influence. This makes her feel unsettled. Need to be more muscular in her Christianity, I guess, because America is changing. Gender is blurred in ways that she said she believes God did not intend. She said a man in her church comes to Sunday services dressed in women's clothing. When she was shopping this fall, a cashier at TJ Maxx who checked her out looked like a man, but as she saw it, had feminine mannerisms. I wanted to shake him and say, you can be the man you are, she said. It's okay to use your strong voice. It's weird that she's so uh, angry about the Fear must be at the root of it. Anyway, she homeschools her children in part to steer clear of these shifts. But the bigger problem, as she sees it, is that the broader culture seems to applaud them. It is not just sexuality. There are other issues, too. For example, what she sees as the left's preoccupation with race and its telling of history. Why all of a sudden are we teaching our five-year-olds to be divided by color, she says. They don't care what color your skin is until you tell them that that five-year-old's grandpa was mean 200 years ago. Sure. 
Demographics are changing too. Growing numbers of Hispanic people and Asian people from the Marshall Islands call Enid home. How about that? Marshall Islands, really. The county of Garfield, in which Enid is the seat, was 94% white in 1980. Last year, that figure was about 68%. So you can see, you know, it's still overwhelmingly white, but it's not overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly white, so therefore a problem. The county experienced one of the largest increases in racial diversity in the county, country rather, over the past decade. 2020 census data shows probably the truth here in Loudoun as well, and I like it, quite honestly. Teachers and administrators in Enid school system have worked hard to integrate growing numbers of immigrant children, but everyone else interviewed in Enid, including Ms. Crabtree, who's not a teacher, except of her own kids, who's white, expressed surprise when told of the scale of this change. Immigrants tend to live in certain parts of town and work in certain jobs, like at the meat plant, and do not yet have high-profile positions of power. That you might say that they've spent 20 years being frustrated at having no voice and being ignored in politics and they're not going to take it anymore. But yes, they all work in the meat plant where the white people don't and they just eat the product there or perhaps raise the product that gets slaughtered there and they don't know who uh, packs the meat that comes out of the big white box at the end. And they're surprised to find out that they're different from them. Teachers and administrators in Enid schools... Oh, yes, I just did this one, sorry. Still, she could feel... That change overall was accelerating, and that was making her feel like she was losing her country, like it was becoming something she did not recognize. It's not 94% white, it's 68% white. I don't recognize it. I truly think that what we are doing is pulling our republic apart at the seams. So, when she heard about the indoor mask mandate proposal last year in her city, she jumped to get involved. Obviously, right? I don't like the fact that so many of our white areas are becoming more diverse. I don't like the fact that there was a guy at TJ Maxx who might have been a little feminine. I got to get involved in this mask mandate. I mean, it may, there's no connection for me. It's just, you know, an opportunity. There's going to be a lot of people who are like me going to this thing because we intend to take over. So I'm going to go too. And now, whatever the issue is, I'm for that too. The indoor mask mandate. Is there a mask mandate at her school? No, she teaches at home. What's her problem? Throw her out. Anyway, so she we heard about the indoor mask mandate proposal last year in her city. She jumped to get involved. She discovered that she liked bringing people together, which is fine. People whose thinking she shared. It felt good to learn together. That's not what's happening, but they are together. And to belong to this group, she was building with urgent purpose. Eventually, she made a Facebook page called Enid Freedom Fighters because of how creative she is. How do I sign up to talk, she said, giving an example of the questions people were asking. I don't know. I'll have to find out and get back to you. How long can we talk? I don't know. I'll find out. I didn't know any of it, but I'm willing to learn. That, that part she's learning. That's good. How things work. She told people to come to the meeting and to wear red shirts so that they could spot one another. That's a good organizing idea. And in July 2020, when she walked into the city council meeting wearing a red dress and a red cardigan sweater and saw the others, she felt nervous but also excited. I just thought, okay, we're not alone. She said, this is worth doing. There are more people like me who care this much. The mandate failed. They could tell their voices mattered. Well, you can see where this is going from here, but there's 10 minutes left to read. So let's keep going. Next up, ostracized from the community. Mr. Waddell voted for the mask mandate, and the reaction was immediate. The following Sunday, people he had prayed with for years avoided him in church because of how Christian they are. The greeters, an older couple he knew well, looked the other way when he walked by. Several people in the church left the church altogether because of his association with it, he said. This might be a good time to tell you, by the way, had anybody guessed? that Mr. Waddell is black? Because he is. I've seen it in the picture. I've seen it in the picture. Uh, just wondering if that may have anything to do with it at all. I don't know. Mr. Waddell listened to critics of the mandate, but their position baffled him. The idea of individual sacrifice for a greater good was ingrained from years in the military. Remember? Honor the troops and everything. This is what they're taught. He grew up in Washington State. The youngest child of black civil servants who had left the Deep South in the 1970s. He went into public service, too, joining the Air Force after a year of college. When he retired seven years ago, 
the uh, he was at a base near Enid, and he and his wife decided to settle in town with their four children. He knew Enid was conservative. Garfield County had voted for the Republican candidate in every presidential election since 1940, but he considered himself conservative, too. He's a registered independent who believes in, <clears throat> you know what, the right to bear arms. But I can't say it because <clears throat> I've been shot in the throat, apparently, all of a sudden. My gosh. Well, he's a registered independent, believes in the right to bear arms, and to uh, choke while he says it. Man. And anyway, national politics were not important to him. Oh, okay. Good schools and low housing prices are what he cared about. Kitchen table issues. He's doing all the right things here. Living his life locally as he should. So Mr. Waddell and his family threw themselves into making Enid home. Mr. Waddell volunteered as an associate pastor at his church. He won a seat on the city council and began looking for funding for youth programs. As a new member, he took constituents out to lunch and listened to their problems. Diner. If this was going to be his home, he wanted to belong and to be helpful to people who lived there. So imagine his dismay at being helpful to people and finding that that was what ostracized him or caused them to ostracize him. But as the months went by, none of the people he had bought lunch for or helped get funding for their organization stood up for him because of how loyal and steadfast they are as Americans. A former military member whom he counted as a friend even joined the Enid Freedom Fighters. He felt as if he were living in a town that no longer recognized him. He, now, he didn't recognize the town, but he feels like the town didn't recognize him. But the other side is saying, we don't recognize our town anymore. The attention he did get was sometimes menacing. His daughter, seven at the time, was picked on at school because of his stance. Military security on the base where Mr. Waddell now works as a civilian handling IT operations took him aside to tell him about threats against him, though noted it did not think that they would be acted on. He began checking a security camera at his house through an app on his phone. There's just this vitriol in this place that we chose, said Mr. Waddell, who's 41. We're ostracized from this community that we chose. It's kind of a surreal feeling. The city commissioner who introduced the mask mandate, Ben Ezell, E-Z-Z-E-L-L, -E -L, a lawyer and artist, got veiled warnings too, mostly via email and Facebook. Someone dumped trash on his lawn. At one city council meeting, a man shouted that he knew where Mr. Ezell lived. Yeah, he lives in Enid. Another meeting got so tense that police officers insisted on escorting him to his car. But Mr. Ezell, who's 35, was not done arguing for the mandate. As summer turned to fall and COVID cases began to spike, it seemed like the logical thing to do, so he kept bringing it up at meetings, prompting Ms. Crabtree and the Freedom Fighters to begin the process of trying to recall him to stop it, as opposed to simply waiting and voting. Wait your turn. It's an American value. She also accused him of acting disrespectfully, for example, for using profanity and doodling during people's speeches he said he drew lemmings walking off cliffs to stay calm, particularly when comment sessions from emotional residents went on for hours. A prominent supporter of the recall effort was Ms. Crabtree's pastor, the one she works for, I guess, Wade Burleson, whose church, Emmanuel Enid, is the largest in town. Enid has a substantial upper middle class with large homes and a gated community near a country club and a golf course. And many of those families are part of this church's 3,000-strong congregation. Mr. Burleson, 59, who served two terms as president of the Southern Baptists of Oklahoma, the largest evangelical denomination in the state. He was considered a moderate in the Southern Baptist tradition, calling for greater leadership roles for women and speaking out for victims of sexual abuse, including asking church leaders to create a database to track predators, an unpopular stance. But in the early months of the pandemic, he started speaking against mask mandates. Hmm. He promoted the work of Dr. Vladimir Zelenko, a Ukrainian-born doctor turned right-wing media star who claimed to have a novel treatment for the coronavirus. Mr. Burleson used apocalyptic language, invoking Nazi doctors as a specter of where mask and vaccine mandates would end up, as opposed to where the novel treatments would end up. Mandates, he argues, are the first steps toward complete government control, and he feels called to warn people. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, here's where it starts getting good for them. We'll read this little bit before we 
jump off the air here. The city council finally passed the mask rule in December of 2020. Interesting they got that through. Mr. Azell said it was toothless, but better than nothing, so he voted for it. And while the recall effort against him ultimately failed, the freedom fighters, now energized, had bigger plans. In February, they swept the local elections, winning three seats on the city council, including Mr. Waddell and Mr. Azell's. Winning felt good, and they kept going. There was no taking yes for an answer for them. Over the course of this year, through a series of elections, appointments, and city council votes, they have helped to get four candidates onto the school board and another four onto the library board, Ms. Crabtree said. The latter, after a disagreement over a display of LGBTQ books for Pride Month. The red shirts have assumed effective control of most of the public bodies in Enid, Mr. Azell said this month. He estimated that those who cared enough about the mask mandates to show up at public meetings to speak against it were a small minority of the city's 50,000 population, but they had an outsized effect on the council's moderate members because in this moment of defensiveness and threat, going against members of your own tribe is extremely difficult and that's what's happening and by the way i might as well point out that with equally small numbers you can appear equally large from the other side just for whatever reason we have not found the will to do it it's still out there as a possibility though from networksradio.com you have been listening to k grow in the morning with Well, maybe Justice Putnam will inspire you to do so as the West Coast cookbook and speakeasy comes up next. Let's see what he's got on tap. Well, let's see. Dr. Fauci warned that the Omicron variant is not something to be taken lightly. You know about that. What's happening in Santa Monica, California? Affordable housing for black families forced out during freeway construction. Now on tap.